وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason of uh, today's lecture, as you know, we're all hearing and seeing the uh, situation in Gaza. Uh, but the story doesn't begin with Gaza, nor does it end with Gaza. And I've been يعني, approached by a lot of people that a lot of people are ignorant about what the story is about. And alhamdulillah, the, يعني, this has been one of the blessings actually in this tragedy that a lot of people have taken interest. A lot of people, they might have heard about the problems in Palestine and the state of Israel and so on, but they never really understood what the background was. Not only talking about uh, modern day politics, but as well, historically. As well, a lot of people are confused about why is this land so special to Muslims? And again, as well, why is this land and this area so special even to the Jews and the Christians? Another question that's asked is, you know, what about the end of times? And a lot of people have heard of, you know, things at the end of times related to this land. So that's why all of these issues in reality are related to one another. We can't uh, separate these issues to understand the issue correctly. And it's important to understand the issue correctly so we can understand what, what's happening, why it's happening, and where is it going. Okay? So first of all, the, this land is not just Palestine or Gaza. What uh, Palestine is, it is just one section of a greater land that we call Bilad al-Sham. In English, they translate it as the Levant. Okay? Now this Bilad al-Sham includes the countries that are now known as Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. But if we want to understand it better, in Iraq there are two main rivers. There's the Tigris River, which is closer to Iran, and there is the Euphrates River, which is closer to Syria. They're the two main rivers in Iraq. And these two rivers in Iraq were a source of great prosperity. You know, if you look at ancient history, a lot of time we think, you know, Europe and so on. History was basically around this area. You might have heard of terms like Babylon and so on. And so this is the era of Iraq. It was very, very rich area. But you have this river, especially the Euphrates River. This is a very important river. Some narrations say that the Euphrates River is a river from Jannah. The origin of it is from Jannah. That's in this area, or if you want to talk about in the north. Then you have in the south, we've all heard of the Nile River in Egypt as well. A river that is very prosperous, that was, you know, you associate the Nile River with Egypt, you associate Egypt with the pharaohs, the pharaohs had a great kingdom, very prosperous, very strong. As well, the Nile River is a very special river. It is a blessed river. Some as well said that the Nile River is a river from Jannah. So now in the north, in Iraq, you have the Euphrates, and in the south, you have the Nile River. Both blessed rivers. This land in between the two rivers is Bilad al-Sham. This land is a blessed land. Some narrations say that this land is a piece of Jannah on earth. The heart and the center of that land is Jerusalem, Bayt al-Maqdis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this land in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to that land as al-ard al-ladhi barakna fiha lil alameen. The land that we have blessed for all nations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this land in the Quran in many places. 
Like for those that were with us in Salat al-Maghrib, we read Surah al-Teen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالتِّينِ وَالزَّيْتُونِ وَطُورِ سِينِينِ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينِ وَالتِّينِ وَالزَّيْتُونِ As the scholars of tafsir, they mentioned التِّين وَالزَّيْتُونِ The figs and the olives. Which land is most famous for having trees of figs and olives? This land, that not Palestine, Bilad al-Sham altogether. But the heart of it is Jerusalem. And surrounding it, that's like the center of the blessing. And that as you go out, that's where the blessing extends. It's all blessed land. So it's the land of figs and olives that Allah refers to in the Quran. Okay. Turi Sinin is the mountain of Sinai, which is in the desert, which is sort of, you could say, part of that land towards the south, which is part of modern day now, part of Egypt. Very desert land. It's where Musa alayhi salam, he traveled with his family and he went up to that mountain and he spoke with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah gave him the revelation. وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ Amin refers to Mecca, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was. And that's where his mission began, but it's not where his mission ends. When the Prophet ﷺ was born, the castles of Syria were lit up. What do the castles of Syria have to do with the birth of Muhammad ﷺ? It is a sign that his message will go to Syria. Why is Syria important? The, the, the lands of Syria, the surrounding these areas, because historically, Whoever rules this land, rules the world. You can look in history. Whoever ruled this land, ruled the world. The strongest in the land, they ruled the world. That's geographically speaking, historically speaking. But even religiously, spiritually, it has a spiritual significance. And so that's why Rasulullah was so keen in spreading Islam to this land. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa led two armies, two major battles to this land. The battle of, uh, of Tabuk and the battle of Mu'tah. And then before he died, he had established an army and tied the battle standard of the army of Usama that was going to go face the Romans. So as well, you might think Romans, you associate Romans with where? With Italy, right? With Europe. The Romans had ruled all of this land. Not only in Europe, their capital actually was in present-day Turkey. Present-day Turkey, Constantinople. That was their capital. And extended through the lands of what is modern-day Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, all the way to where is today Tabuk, which is on close to the border between, it's actually technically in Saudi Arabia today, but it's close to the border of Jordan. And... Uh, extends, the Roman Empire extended to, to uh, Egypt and North Africa, all around the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, yeah, I wish that I was, uh, yeah, I wanted to have a PowerPoint presentation, show you the maps and everything for those who are not familiar with the geography. But the Romans ruled that land at one point in time, especially towards the time of the Prophet So anyway, what I wanted to show is that yeah, this land is a blessed land. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, not only in this Muslim tradition as well. Yani this is something, a, a land that is considered holy and special by the Jews and by the Christians. And by the Muslims. And this is something that adds to the modern situation. And I'm going to be talking about that soon. Okay. That this land is holy by both. Now, we don't really see the Christians playing a major role in this, in this modern-day conflict because the Christians ruled you know, these lands for a period of time during the Roman rule, and actually the major Christian cities were in these lands. Okay, So, for example, Jerusalem was somewhere very important as a Christian capital. Uh, Damascus was an important Christian capital. Um, uh, you had as well, yeah, and there are certain capitals, even, and yeah, you might have heard of the Council of Nicaea, and Nicaea is in present day Turkey. A lot of these traditional, yeah, and Christian, you might have, have, hear it in Christian history, these are all 
places in modern day Syria and Turkey and so on. Okay, so this land was very important to them. So then this is why at one stage in history, when the Muslims took over this land, the Christians, they felt that this was, a, 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 this was bad for them. Because for the Muslims to be ruling the Holy Land, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa, as Allah refers to it as well, the Holy Land, the Blessed Land, is a sign to the Christians that the Muslims, their religion is true. So the Christians did not want, did not want to accept that, especially since the Muslims had conquered a lot of even European lands. And so that's why they started the crusade wars against the Muslims to regain the Holy Land from the Muslims. And they were successful to some degree. And the history of the crusades is a long discussion as well. But for almost a hundred years, the crusaders were in the Holy Land until they were famously defeated by Salah al-Din's army in Hattin. Okay, but they weren't completely, they were just removed out of yeah, in Jerusalem and a lot of the other areas, but they were still had strongholds in other places. Like, for example, Tripoli in Lebanon was still, even after Salah al-Din, he couldn't break the Christian crusaders in Tripoli and in other places. But it came then in the later uh, leadership of the Mamalik, the Mamluks, they finally wiped out all Christian presence in the Holy Land. And from that day until now, the Christians have given up having any any dominance and, and, and significant political presence in the Holy Land. Okay? They've relinquished that. There's no, they, they have no hope of ever gaining that back to make it back Christian lands again. So now we see that these lands are important and holy by, by the, the Muslims, as we said, the Christians and the Jews. Now, when it comes to the Jews... We see, as we said, because our traditions are any common. There's a lot of commonality in our traditions. We share the same prophets and so on. But how they view and interpret these things may be different. So first of all, one of the claims that they say is that uh, uh, Palestine or... or uh, yeah, and here the thing is, this is why it's important as well. They don't think that this issue is only about Gaza today. It's only about Palestine. Right? Their aim is all of the entire Holy Land. And so this really answers a lot of our questions, not only about Gaza, but they know you would think they're crazy. How can they take all of this land between the Euphrates River and the Nile River? How can they be so crazy? They know that it's a big task, that they're not going to try to take it all at once. It's bit by bit. And this is something that has, not, this is not my words, this is something that we see, historically speaking, and as well something that has been said by various politicians, for example, President Truman of America. And we'll see as well the role that the, the Western or the European empires, whether it's the British or then the Americans, how they played in this issue as well. But I just want to take you back a little bit in history so that we can have as well a better understanding of what's happening. So we know that Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he actually came from originally which place? Anyone know? Huh? Babylon, so Iraq. That's where he was from originally. Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that's where there was the idols and that's where they threw him into the fire. And then after that, he left that place. And he went to Bilad al-Sham. And he went to Bilad al-Sham. From Bilad al-Sham, he then went to Egypt. And that's where he famously got his wife Hajar, who's the mother of Ismail alayhi salam. Okay? But he settled later on with Hajar and his First wife, Sarah, who is the mother of Ishaq. So the so Prophet Ibrahim had two sons, Ismail from Hajar and Ishaq from Sarah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we know the story as well of how Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba with his son. And Allah tested him to slaughter his son and the story. But this is يعني, just so that uh, you go over it quickly. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he didn't have a nation, he didn't have a people. But Allah honored him that Allah would give him a son and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him that he made his son and his grandson prophets. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his son Ishaq and Ya'qub prophets. 
that is greater. Imagine how happy are you if your son becomes a hafiz of the Quran? How, pr how proud would you be? Just to be hafiz of the Quran. How proud would you be if your son not only memorized the Quran, a lot of people memorize the entire Quran. He memorized all of the books of Hadith, the six books of Hadith, memorize them all off by heart. How proud would you be? How proud would you be if your son was the greatest alim in the world? How proud would you be if your son was the imam of the masjid in Mecca? How proud would you be if your son was a prophet of Allah? Doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, how much you have memorized, you cannot get better than being a prophet of Allah who gets wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was an honor for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Not only his son, but as well his grandson. Ya'qub alayhi salam is also a prophet from Allah. Allah blessed Ibrahim to see his son and his grandson being prophets of Allah. And Allah promised Ibrahim that prophethood would be in his progeny. Not only from Ishaq and Ya'qub, but also from Ismail. But no prophet came from after Ismail until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is a secret and a wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any case, the story of Ishaq and Ya'qub, and then Ya'qub alayhi salam had 12 sons. Had 12 sons. And most famous of those sons was Yusuf alayhi salam. And Yusuf as well was a prophet. So once they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, who's the most honorable person? Who's got the best lineage? You know how sometimes today, who's better, the Lebanese or the Syrians or the Pakistanis or the Indians or the Bangladeshis? Okay, even the Lebanese, who's better, the Tripoli people or the Minya people? Okay, the Minya people, who's best out of the Minya people? Is it the Alam al or is it the Zraiqas? Or is it, you know, there's always this competition. Even the Arabs that had that. Who's the most honorable? Uh, this tribe or this tribe or this tribe, the Prophet sallallahu he said, Yusuf alayhi salam is the most honorable because he is a prophet, the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet. No one can claim that lineage. Huwa al-Kareem, ibn al-Kareem, ibn al-Kareem, ibn al-Kareem. Alayhi salatu wassalam, ala nabi anna salatu wassalam. So Yusuf alayhi salam, as we know, cut a long story short, they were in this land of Palestine. This land of Palestine. And Yusuf alayhi salam was taken to Egypt. He was made the king of Egypt. As well, there was a famine. So his brothers came to take food stocks that Yusuf alayhi salam was in charge of. He gave his brothers food stocks. When Yusuf alayhi salam saved Egypt from the famine because of his good administration of the food stocks, or else people would have taken, like when we had the pandemic of COVID, everyone just thinks of themselves and wants to eat and fill his stomach, doesn't care about anyone else. Yusuf alayhi salam made everyone give a fair share, enough for themselves, enough to survive. That way everyone survived and he saved Egypt and he was celebrated as a savior. And so they gave him a high status and so they invited him to bring his family and he bring his family. Everyone loved Yusuf alayhi salam loved his, out of their love for Yusuf, they loved him and his brothers and his family. Ahlu sahla fikum. And so these 12 brothers, they lived and they got married and they had children and they had children and they had children until they became a huge nation in Egypt. But what happens with a lot of people who may come from honorable origins? They take that honor for granted. Just because your father, great, great, great grandfather was honorable doesn't mean that you will always be honorable. They started to become corrupt. And there are narrations that say that they tried to make a rebellion and tried to rebel against the Egyptian rulers. And so the king, you know, whenever there's any rebellion, what does the king do? He smashes the rebellion. And he saw that they were now a threat. And so now the children of Israel, after being honored generations later, after being respected and honored from the time of Yusuf alayhi salam, they became subjugated, humiliated. They became يعني, uh, 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 يعني controlled because they weren't given any, they didn't honor the respect that they were given from the time of Yusuf. So they were treated as slaves. Until one day, one of the pharaohs, he saw in a dream that a fire came out from one of the homes of the, of the children of Israel, because the children of Israel were like yani, peasants, were like slaves. They lived in their own little neighborhood. A fire came out of one of the homes of the Bani Israel, and it burnt all of the kingdom of Egypt. And so the Pharaoh was very troubled by this dream, 
and he went to get it interpreted, and it was interpreted that one of the children of the children of Israel will one day destroy your kingdom. So this was a prophecy he saw in his dream. And like a lot of people, if something, if Allah wills something, is there anything you can do to stop it? No matter what you do, it won't stop it. Actually, the actions that you take won't stop it, actually make it happen. So instead of the Pharaoh taking admonition from this, he thought he wants to stop the Qadr of Allah. So I said, okay, that means one of the children of the children of Israel, I'm going to kill all of their sons. Kill all of their sons. So he came and started slaughtering all of their sons. But then he had a problem. When you get rid of all the boys and he left the girls alive so that they would be subjugated, they would be humiliated, and they would have to be in the service of the Egyptians, of especially the Egyptian leaders and elites. But then what will happen, that even if you keep the women alive, Gradually, they'll get older, they'll die, and there'll be no men to procreate and make more slaves. Eventually, you have no more slaves in Egypt if you kill all of the, all of the boys. So he thought this is not a good plan. What, did, what was his plan? To kill the boys one year and to leave the boys of the next year. And this as well, this policy is a very dangerous policy that's being practiced today. But it's not the Pharaohs doing it to the children of Israel. It's for those who claim that they are the children of Israel. They are doing that to the Palestinian population today. They don't necessarily want to annihilate the Palestinian population. They want to keep some. They want to keep some. A controllable amount. This is not my words. This is the words of Benjamin Netanyahu who gave a interview I believe when he visited Australia only a few years ago. And they said, okay, what's the solution? Kick all the Palestinians out, kill them all? Or the solution is, as a lot of people they say, why don't you just allow the Palestinians to be, you know, part of your, um, part of your nation, citizens like Muslims are citizens of Australia and other countries. Just let them be citizens of your country. He said they're too much. And then they could overpower us. They could overthrow us. So he only wants a small amount. Because now they use that to their advantage. They say, look, see, we're not apartheid. We're not racist. We've got Arabs who are citizens of Israel. And there are Arabs, Muslims, who are citizens. They call them the 48 Arabs. They're the ones who stayed in their Jewish areas who weren't kicked out or they, they, they were stubborn ones who decided to stay and whatever it was, whatever reasons, but they stayed within their limits. You might have heard of 48 Arabs and 67 borders and so on. I don't want to go into a lot of the, yeah, any of the details of it. But there are some Arabs who were given Israeli citizenship and they have Israeli passports and they have the right to uh, health care and education and so on. But still even these Arabs, Israeli Arabs, they are not treated equally. There's a lot of prejudice against them. There are a lot of, as well, they're not treated equally. But even the interviewer, he said to him, but even these Arab Israelis, the Arabs are known, generally the Palestinians or the Arabs, they, they, they have a lot more children than the Jews. So as well, over time, even these Arab Israelis could possibly outnumber you. He said, no. Listen to this very carefully. He said, he said we have seen that whenever the Palestinian, because they, they have afforded the opportunity for education like us here, they go to university and so on. He said, when the Palestinian women go to school and they go to university, they don't have a lot of children. Like what's happening with us here. So that keeps their numbers low, controllable number. Because if you don't, if, if, if you, if you don't have a birth rate of more than two, you're dead. You're because you need more than two in any uh, demographic. If you want to increase your population, you have to have at least more than two, at least. Because if you just have two kids, then one kid replaces mum and one kid replaces dad. So what, what have you done? You haven't increased your numbers. But because people are educated, they don't want to get married, 
You know, they want to finish their education, especially women. They want to finish their education, and then they get very picky that I want to get married because he's not a doctor like I am. And it has to be this, and it has to be uh, more educated than me. I have a PhD. He has to have double PhD to be better than me. He has to earn more money than me. He has to be older than me. He has to be more handsome than me. This is impossible or very, very hard. That's why a lot of them, either they don't get married or they get married later in life, or even if they get married, they only have any few children. And so, see how any of these things, and as well, life, especially for Palestinians, they're disadvantaged, so life is very difficult, very expensive. And it's not easy for them to find housing and so on. And we saw you know, a lot of the anguish, like for example, what happened in Sheikh Jarrah. They're kicked out of any opportunity. The Arabs are kicked out of their homes for any technicality. They use an excuse that, you know, they did something against council approval. So they just bulldoze their home. And they become another refugee and outside of. So this policy of cutting down the numbers to control the population is a Fir'aunic policy that we see being practiced today. That's why I said going back in history is very important to understand what's happening. So the Pharaoh, this is what he did, subjugated the people. But still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah wills for something to happen, the most impossible and the most unlikely solution will come. And the solution came from this one little boy that they made an exception for, Right? who is Musa alayhi salam, and they even raised him in their palace. He later came to be the Prophet of Allah, Musa alayhi salam, who would lead Bani Israel out of, out of Egypt. And we know the story how Allah ta'ala destroyed the Pharaoh and his army in one blink of an eye and drowned them in the sea. But then now Musa alayhi salam takes Bani Israel out of Egypt. The question is, why didn't he go back to Egypt? Egypt now is empty. They can now become the rulers of Egypt. Egypt is a very prosperous, rich place. Go and rule Egypt. Go live in Egypt. Instead of you being the slaves of Egypt, become, become the kings of Egypt. Because there's something, no matter how prosperous. You have to think Egypt in those days was like, how do you think the most beautiful country, Sweden, Switzerland, whatever you want to call it, the most prosperous, wealthy place in the world. This is nothing. Allah has promised you somewhere better than that. Allah Ta'ala says, Ya qawm idkhulu al-arda al-muqaddasata al-lati katab Allahu lakum wa la tartaddu ala aqabikum fatanqalibu khasirin. O oh my people, enter the land, the holy land, al-arda al-muqaddasa al-lati katab Allahu lakum. That Allah has written it for you, has promised it for you. So the Jews, they say, see, even in your Quran it says that the, the land is Promised to the Jews. It was to the true believers of Allah, the followers of Musa alayhi salam. It was promised to them. But you are not followers of Musa alayhi salam today because Musa alayhi salam told you to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And by you rejecting Muhammad, you have rejected Musa alayhi salam. So Allah ta'ala didn't tell them go back to Egypt. Allah told them go to Al Ard al Muqaddasa, go to the blessed land. That Allah has written and prescribed for you. And don't turn back on your, on your heels or else you will be losers. But the rewards of Allah doesn't come easy. There has to be struggle. So who was living in that land? It's not like what the media has you to believe. That this land of Palestine has always been for the Jews. Only Jews have ever lived there. This is a lie. Historically there's been many nations and many peoples that have lived there. So at that time, there was Al-Qawm Al-Jabbarin, who used to live in that land. And even from the name, Al-Jabbarin means the mighty people, strong people, people who are ruthless. They used to live in this land. So the Bani Israel, they said, we're weak people. We can't fight against these people, Jabbarin. If we enter, they're going to kill us. قالوا إن فيها قوما جبارين وإنا لن ندخلها حتى يخرجوا منها. So we're not going to enter the enter the city of Jerusalem until the Jabbarin get out of it. They want the Jabbarin to get out and they want to enter without any fighting. If they get out of it, make dua to Allah, whatever, make him get out. They, they want an easy way. With no fighting, no struggle. If they leave it, if they get out, then we will enter. Then two men, Allah Ta'ala said, sent 
as Ramadan. Qala rajulani min alladina khafuna an'am Allahu alayhim adkhulu alayhim al-bad. Just enter the door. Just enter the door of Jerusalem. Enter the gates of Jerusalem. And as Allah says, adkhulu al-baba sujjadan wa qulu hittah. Enter the doors with your heads bowed down. And say hitta, meaning hatta anna thunubana, mean forgive us our sins. فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمُهُ فَإِنَّكُمْ غَالِبُونَ If you enter the gates of the city, you'll be victorious. That's all they had to do. How? Why? How's it possible? Don't ask. Allah will make it happen. You just saw Allah destroyed Pharaoh. How did it happen? Allah can do anything. Have faith in Allah. Just do it. They said to Musa, اِذْهَبْ أَنْتَ وَرَبُّكَ فَقَاتِلَا إِنَّا هَهُونَا قَاعِدُونَ you believe that Allah gave you this promise? Allah doesn't need us. You can go, you and your Lord. Look, look at the, subhanAllah, the disrespect. Go, you and your Lord and fight. We're here waiting for you. When you finish, we're here waiting for you. We'll go in. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed and damned the children of Israel to be 40 years in the desert. Lost in the desert. And this was a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a purification for Bani Israel. So they can learn their lesson. And this is as well a lesson for us. That sometimes the Muslims, why is this happening to us? Because we don't listen to the command of Allah. We doubt in the power of Allah. So Allah makes us suffer. Suffer in the desert. But still Allah made them in the desert, but Allah still blessed them. Subhanallah. Allah gave them water and Allah gave them food. Al-Man was Salwa and Allah gave him a rock that whenever Musa alayhi salam taps it, 12 springs come out of the rock. They drink and they have clothes and they have shade. Allah gave him whatever they need, basic necessity. But obviously, it's not a comfortable life. Still, they were frustrated. Until generations passed, 40 years. So what will happen in 40 years? The older generation, whoever was 20 years old, by that time he's 40, 40 years later, 60, 60, 70, خلاص, he passes away. The ones now, the new generation, came up. The new generation, all they know is the desert. They, where's uh, YouTube? Where's Netflix? Where's iPads? Where's TV? Nothing. What do they have? They have Musa alayhi salam teaching them the Torah. That's all they have. That's all they have. And so now you had a generation who are being discipled by Musa alayhi salam. Now, what do you think are going to come out of them? People who are strong in their faith. Because those, many Israelis who came out of Egypt, they came with a, they came with a, a, with a slave mentality. We can't do anything. We need our leader. We need our... We. These people are not good. The slave mentality. You need people who are driven by faith. One of the brothers that I know, his family is originally from Gaza. And he told me the people of Gaza were known to be the most irreligious people of all the Palestinians. That's what the brother told me. I don't know. He told me they were very like, they used to like swear and they used to curse Allah in their swearing like it's nothing. It was normal. He said, when I went and visited, this was a couple of years ago. He said, when I went and visited Gaza now. Everywhere you go, masajid. Everywhere you go, tahfidh Qur'an, huffaz, masha'Allah, salah, deen. Tad he goes, I couldn't believe it. How? In those years, they changed from a people who are not very committed to the deen. How they, they have nothing. So where do they turn to? They turn to their religion and turn to Allah, turn to the Qur'an. This is, wallahi, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what happened to Bani Israel is happening to this ummah. So what happened to Bani Israel? They were in the desert for 40 years. Now a new generation came. Young, full of faith, full of religious zeal, like many of our youth today. Many of our youth, they see the situation of the ummah. They say, we are Muslims. We want to have the glory that we had. Allah has promised this ummah to be glorious and to be strong and to be so on. As Allah mentions to us in the Quran, that they said to their Prophet Musa alayhi salam, at this stage he passed away, Allah sent another Prophet. 
They said to their prophet, Make for us a king so that we can fight for the sake of Allah. This as well teaches us something very important and un un understanding the current conflict as well. The Bani Israel already had a prophet. Why did they ask for a king to fight in the cause of Allah? Because it was part of their religion that the Bani Israel are not allowed to be led in war except by a king who is anointed by Allah. They are not allowed to be led by anyone else. Why? Because if you're led by a king who's leading you as a religious nation, this king could do something wrong. And so maybe he's fighting not for Allah, not for God, not for the glory of God. Maybe he's fighting for land. Maybe he's fighting for wealth. Maybe he's fighting for power. So you'll be fighting behind him for an irreligious and a, a cause that is not noble and not godly. So they have to be led by a king who is anointed by Allah so that when they fight, they make sure that they are fighting a, for a true cause, for a noble cause, for a godly cause. Okay? So Allah Ta'ala sends to them a king, Talut. But as well, they didn't like this king. They said, that this king, he's poor. When a king who's rich. So even they ask something and then when it doesn't come as they want, they want to pick and choose. Allah sent him. This is as well part of our problem today as well as Muslims. We want this and we want this and we want this. And then when we get it, we don't like it. We get picky. We want all the Muslims to be united and we want so on and we want our uh, masjid and whatever. And then if the imam is not from the same tribe and not from the same village that you're from, you don't like the imam. How many of our Islamic organizations, they're like that? They split up because the imam is not from my village. We want an imam, we want a leader, we want a community. But when it doesn't come how you like it, you don't want it. So this is how the Bani Israel was. They said, and this as well. We're more rightful of kingship than him. Everyone wants to be the leader. What is he the leader for? I want to be the leader. I'm more rightful. I am more. You know, uh, you know, they use their own reasons why they should be the leader instead of someone else. This is wallahi lessons we have to learn for ourselves. But then the Prophet told them, Inna Allah. Allah has preferred him over you and has given preference in knowledge and strength, physical strength, bodily strength. And Allah gives his dominion to whom he wants. In the story, we know that they fought against as well these Goliaths. Jalut and his army, huge giants, unbelievable. And as well, by the way, Bani Israel numbered in the hundreds of thousands. All of them saying, we want to fight, we want to fight, we want to establish our nation and so on. We want to enter Bani Is we want to enter the Holy Land. And then when actually came time to fight, only a few. Out of the hundreds of thousands, only a few. And then when they were tested by the river, most of them they said, I'm going to drink from the river, I'm thirsty, man, I can't deal with this. They drank from the river and only a few a few of a few of a few that ended up with the Prophet. So this as well tells us as well that a lot of people that they talk, but when it comes to seriousness, when push comes to shove, only few will follow. And this as well tells us at the end of times, the amount of people that will be with the Mahdi at the end of time is only a few. I think the narration says about 7,000. Imagine today, we, we're proud of... One billion Muslims. We we'll ask Allah to make us of those who are true and of the few and the chosen ones from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These all teach us very important lessons of what's going to happen. And then, as we know, Dawood killed Jalut and then Allah made him a king after Talut. And Dawood becomes now the first prophet and king of the children of Israel in Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. And he's the capital in Jerusalem. And then after him comes Sulaiman. But then afterwards, as we said, the people become corrupt. And so when people become corrupt, Allah sends people to teach them a lesson. Because people who are supposed to be people of God 
if they don't live up to their God-given responsibilities, this is the religion of God. And Allah does not allow for his religion to be marred by people who falsely represent it. And so he sent to them Bakhta Nasr. Bakhta Nasr was a Persian ruler who conquered a lot of that area, as we said, this area of the Middle East today, what they call the Middle East, until he came to uh, Jerusalem and he destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple or the castle that Dawood had. He destroyed it and he took the children of Israel as slaves and he dispersed them in his kingdom. And that's why you'll find Jewish populations in the most unlikely place. In that place because this is part of the problem as well. That we only associate Jews and the return of Jews to Jerusalem, only Jews coming from Europe. But this is not the fact. There was many Jews that lived in Muslim countries, in North Africa, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran, in Central Asia, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and all of these things, even in Afghanistan, until recently I even saw an interview with an old man who was a Jew living in Kabul in Afghanistan until recently. It was an old man, I think he passed away or he moved. But there was a thriving community in all of this, but even in India and so on. So many places. And this as well adds to the story. Understanding this fact is very important. Because the issue of Israel isn't necessarily about Jews. It's about specifically European Jews. Even non-European Jews are discriminated against in the state of Israel. They call the Ashkenazi Jews and even the Ethiopian Jews even more discriminated against. So it shows there are other dimensions to this. And it just shows as well how like if these people are even against and they, you know, uh, you know it shows that there is another layer of sort of bias and discrimination in this, uh, in, in, in understanding this. And this as well shows you as well the link between the Europeans, whether they are Jews or Christians. Anyway, so Bakhta Nassar or Abakanez or Nabakanez, they call him in English, he dispersed the Jewish population in the land. And as well, this affected the Jewish people in a number of ways. One is that their language was lost. Because it's like a lot of us, for example, Arabs who come and live in the West. What happens to our Arabic after one generation? We are, we are second generation. We speak half Arabic. Our kids speak how much Arabic? Uh, zero. We say, let's say a quarter Arabic. The next one after that, is that I'm going to have some hibas. No, the kha and the ha and everything's finished. You pick up a few words here. So imagine what happened to the Jewish language when they are in a society that is doesn't allow the proliferation of their language, natural language is going gonna, is gonna to die. No one stopped us from speaking Arabic, for example. Already, nahna by ourselves, we killed the Arabic. We killed Arabic by ourselves because we don't want to speak to our children in Arabic because we don't want to speak to our children in Arabic. We don't want to speak to our grandchildren in Arabic. So our language has been killed by our own hands because we want to look uh, classy. It's not classy to speak Arabic. Even, wallahi, speaking now Arabic in the masjid, wallahi, it's a shame. It's a shame. The masjid, how dare we speak any language other than Arabic? Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Anyway, so the Jews were affected in that their language was lost. And as well, a lot of their scriptures were lost because they were persecuted. And as well, naturally, when you are a, a, a minority in a foreign land, you're going to lose a lot of your identity. That's why even the Hebrew language was a lost language. They had to actually, ancient Hebrew is lost completely. What they did, they had to actually rebuild the language. From It was a dead language. They had to actually rebuild it. Even their scriptures were lost. 
And Allah mentions in the Quran that their scriptures are not the original scriptures. Allah Ta'ala says, بِمَا اسْتُحْفِظُوا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ They have what they had remnant rem memories, what they memorized, what they kept in their memories, they recorded it and they preserved it. So that means a lot of, the thing, a lot of their knowledge is lost or it's sometimes, you know, people's memories, you know, they didn't memorize their texts like we memorize the Quran. The Quran is preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, preserved in the hearts and the memories of the Muslims. This is a unique book. But their books, they memorize parts. This, this rabbi, or this uh, hakam or scholar, memorized some parts and some parts and some parts, and they came together and they tried to piece it together. And then they came back and established, after many long time, they came and established their kingdom once again. But again, they became corrupt and Allah sent this time the Romans and they destroyed their temple and as well they dispersed the children of Israel into different places. One of the places that the children of Israel came to was Arabia. And that tells you why there were Jews in Medina. We learn in our seerah that the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca. There was no Jews there. But then when he went to Medina, there was a considerable Jewish population there. In Khaybar, there was Jews. In other places, places in Arabia, there were Jews. And probably you ask, why are there Jews in Arabia? doesn't make sense. Because they were dispersed. And because they were driven out of their holy land, they came to a land that was prophesied in their texts that a chosen one will be sent to this land and he would be, bring honor to the believers. And so in their text, it was described that this land is between two mountains and has palm, uh, date palm groves. And so in Arabia, they looked in this area that's described in northern Arabia, in a land that is between two mountains and has date palm groves. They looked for every city and every town that resembled that. They went to Mecca. Mecca doesn't have fi wadin ghayri di zara'in. It has no, uh, it's not Mecca. They went to Medina. Medina is between two mountains, has they palm groves, they settled in Medina. They went to Khaybar, close, you know, they settled there. Just in case they're waiting for this prophet that is going to be sent at the end of times that will bring honor to the believers and that will slaughter the disbelievers. This was prophesied in their books. And so they used to say, the Jews in Medina used to say to the Arabs, to the pagan Arabs in Medina, one day our prophet will come and we will slaughter you Arabs because you guys are idol worshippers, disbelievers, we'll, we'll slaughter you. This is what they used to say. One day our, our, our Messiah will come and we'll slaughter you. One day our Messiah will come and slaughter you. When the Messiah came, he was from the Arabs, from the descendants of Ismail, and so they rejected him. They said he's not him. Even though he was truly the one who was prophesied in their books. And so instead of believing in him, they disbelieved in him. Instead of them being the ones who would honor the prophet and slaughter the disbelievers, they're the ones who became the disbelievers. And it was those people who were idol worshippers who became the believers and stood up with the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messiah. We say the Messiah, a lot of the things we associate the Messiah, the Messiah is the chosen one, the blessed one from Allah. And this is one of the titles of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is al-Masih as well. So it's because of this promise that there will come a Messiah. There will come a Messiah to the Jews. So the Jews now, when the Messiah Isa salam came, they rejected him. When the Messiah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came, they rejected him. So what are they waiting for? They're still waiting for a Messiah. They're still waiting for a Messiah. The Messiah already came twice. They said, no, we're still waiting for the Messiah. Now, this is where we're at now. I told you before that the Jews had a belief in them. Okay, there's, there's two things that the Christians and Jews both had in common. And as well, the Muslims as well. That one of the signs before the Day of Judgment is that the Bani Israel will come back together in Al-Ardul Mubarakah. This is one of the prophecies of b before the end of times. This is something believed by the Jews and by the Christians and even by the Muslims. 
طيب, the Jews, they said, as well, we're waiting for a Messiah. When will the Messiah come? When the Jews come to Bayt al-Maqdis. Okay? So, instead of them just living their life normally and waiting for this to happen, they wanted to force it to happen. And we said that the prophecies of Allah and the promises of Allah, can they be forced? Can they be changed? They can't. طيب, the Jews have another problem. That in their religion, they are not allowed to be led by a king who is not anointed by Allah. They're not allowed to have a state. They're not allowed to have an army. They're not allowed to fight without being led by a king. So how did they do that? They said, we now will make the state of Israel to prepare for the Messiah. That's why you have some Jews who are anti-Zionists. You might have seen them. Why the anti-Zionists, they say that these people, what they're doing, these Jews who are doing Israel, they're doing bid'ah. This is not from our religion. This is haram. And as well, what shows that this state of Israel is wrong is that they're not even following the Torah law. They're illegitimate. We are not allowed to have a state. We have to wait for the Messiah to come. The Messiah makes a state for us. We're not allowed to do a state. So that's why you have, and this was, the, this was the standard belief of the Jews. This idea of the Jews having their own state in Israel and Zion, what's called Zionism. This is a relatively new concept. The Jews never had this before. Okay? Now, a person might ask a question. Thay, why are the Christian nations supporting them? Why Britain and America are supporting them? Because there is something called Christian Zionism. Where as well, this is a new concept. Because as we said, the Jews were the chosen people of Allah. But then, what was the normal belief of the Christians traditionally, is that this promise to the Jews had now transferred to the Christians. Because they are the believers in the Messiah. They rejected the Messiah. They're out of the promise of Allah. So now the promise that Allah gave to the Jews has now been transferred to the Christians because they are followers of the Messiah, Isa alayhi salam. Okay. So that was the normal belief of the... So, so that's why the Christians didn't believe that the Jews have any of the promises of Allah. That they are not valid for them anymore. All of the promises of Allah that were for the Jews now transfer to the Christians because they are the followers of the Messiah Isa. But then you had a new idea that was only about 200 years old. In the 1800s approximately. That was promoted with the Christians. What they call Christian Zionism. Where Christians believe that them helping the Jews come to the promised land to the blessed land will bring the return of Isa alayhi salam that's prophesied at the end of days. That was one of the reasons why now there is an alliance. So now they both agree on the same thing. But these are both from uh, bid'ah, both Christian bid'ah and a Jewish bid'ah that they made together. Or not, they just Allahu Alam who taught the other. Surprisingly, you have another group of people among the Muslims who have a very similar belief to this. And there are three dots. As well, they believe that they cannot be led except by Imam Ma'asum. You have a group who claim to be Muslim, they said that we can only be led by Imam Ma'asum. And so they don't have Imam Ma'asum. Now they say we're not allowed to have a Dawla. We're not allowed to have a state. Until someone came with this Islamic Zionism. His name is Khomeini. He created a bid'ah called, even, even it's a bid'ah in the Shia belief, it's called Wilayatul Faqih. Which means that the Faqih, the Imam, the, the, the scholar, the Alim, can take the rulings of the Imam and prepare for the Imam for the coming of the Imam. Imam al-Mahdi. Who's the Imam al-Mahdi of the Shia? So before that, that's why traditionally the, the Shia did not have any like uh, empire or state or anything like that. Because it was actually, that's why even there are some Shia who are against this. There are very few though. Who are against, they say that this Wilayat al-Faqih is something that was invented 
Baal Khomeini. And Allahu Alam, he could have got that idea from Christian or Jewish Zionism that came up as a preparation for the Holy Land. And that's why, I don't know if you've been seeing, there's a lot of as well that this is now the coming of the Mahdi and a lot of the Shia now are very excited about the return of the Mahdi. So you have to understand that there is, this issue is not just the issue of now of Gaza, whatever. There's a lot of uh, ideological belief behind it. And it's not only, wallah, now they solve the problem of Gaza and then that's it. There is a bigger story that they're working on. And their promise will not be fulfilled until they get all of what they believe to be the promised land for them. But we believe that this promised land is promised for the believers, as Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. That the earth will be inherited by my righteous servants. And that this promise is for the Ummah of Muhammad. But now this is a struggle. And really, at the end of the day, what does it come to? They say, even. One of the foreign minister for Israel, she said, this is our land because our Bible said so. It's like, your Bible said so. Why? I don't believe in your Bible. Why are you forcing me to accept something not part of my religion? You can't force my belief on me. So it becomes an issue of whose religion is true. That's at the end of the day what it becomes. So if they are forcing this because they want to establish that their religion is the true religion. And now, because of this Christian Zionism that has been adopted, especially by, uh, especially by uh, uh, what they call evangelical Christians, and it's been generally accepted. And even in Europe, the, yani, the, there's many reasons, not only because of Christian Zionism, also uh, for other political reasons why they support yani, the, 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 yani, the return of Jews to uh, the Holy Land. And by the way, yani, they use the excuse that they were Yani persecuted in Europe and so on and so on. If it was just a place for them to have a safe place to live, طيب, you're not being, your lives are not being threatened now. طيب, even after World War II, they were offered other places in the world to settle. They were actually offered Argentina to settle in. They were offered Uganda to settle in. Other places, but they wanted uh, the land of Palestine, as I said, as a fulfillment of their religious belief, their religious ideology. As Muslims, this goes against what we believe. At the end of the day, we do not force our belief on anyone. We know that everything is in the hands of Allah. No matter what they do, Allah's will will happen. And actually fighting against the will of Allah is useless. And will actually make the will of Allah come. You can't resist the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yani it's very, very important for us to learn from these lessons and the history. And to know that at the end of the day, we have to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, as Allah gave that promise to Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel to enter the city with your heads bowed down and Allah will give you victory. Likewise, let us bow down our heads and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us victory. Don't ask how Allah is able to do everything. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha 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 ilaha